I mean, the, the cops haven't been in this situation before. You know, we haven't been in this situation before where we've got information that the cops don't have that could be determinative. This is director Andrew Jarecki and producer Mark Smerling talking on the phone late at night, the day they found the letter implicating Robert Durst in Susan Berman's murder. The quality of the tape isn't great, but it's incredible to hear them in this moment in time, having just cracked the case. I mean, do you have any doubt in your mind right now based on everything you've learned that Bob killed Susan? No, no doubt. After seeing that letter, I was like, I was just, that was it. I had doubt. I lost all my doubt. Yeah, it's gone. So I guess, you know, therefore, we now know that Bob killed Susan. And once you know Bob killed Susan, you know that he killed them all. Now the question was, what were they going to do with the evidence? Hi, I'm Zach Stewart-Pontier, one of the filmmakers behind HBO's The Jinx. Welcome to the official Jinx podcast, a show where we take you behind the scenes of Andrew Jarecki's documentary series that became a real-life murder investigation. Part two's release is just around the corner, Sunday, April 21st on Max. And today on the show, we've made it to the final episode of part one, chapter six, What the Hell Did I Do? When you first see the note, uh, when I first saw the note, it's the thing that you always want, and it's the thing you think you're never gonna get. This is Andrew in the car in LA, talking about the moment he saw the envelope for the first time. He says, it was a moment of truth. You know, you spend years working on something, and then you think, it couldn't possibly be this simple. There's no way this is the thing. Left turn on Northwestern Avenue. You know? Two miles. And that's the thing. You know, and then you're sitting there sort of pinching yourself for a long time, thinking, all right, I'm sure this isn't the thing. I got to keep thinking about why it's not the thing. For the filmmaking team, finding the evidence of Bob's guilt changed the objective. It was no longer simply about telling a story. What are our three goals? Mark asks Andrew, what are our three goals? First goal is to seek justice. Our second goal is to make a really great film. And our third goal, I think, is to not get into trouble along the way that makes it harder to seek justice or make a really good film. We called a former L.A. prosecutor for some advice on what to do next. We're going to see Marsha Clark, who hopefully is going to be our ex-L.A. prosecutor, now defense attorney, who's going to help us uh, conceive of the best way to use this new round of data. Marsha Clark is best known as the prosecutor in the O.J. Simpson case. So, Marsha, you're a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes to you and says, this is what we got. And then we show you this handwriting stuff. Are you prepared to take on the case? I'm pretty damn close. Pretty close. I mean, I was a cowboy before Simpson. <laughs> Marsha knows firsthand what it's like to go up against a wealthy defendant with an expensive legal team. And she says it's not a slam dunk because the main piece of evidence in this case is unusual. The cadaver note is very... It's weird because it's a little bit cryptic. It's not a confession. We know what that is, but it, it can be very compelling when you look at it like that. When you start to dissect it the way the defense will do, and first of all, you attack the note. If you can, you say, you can't even prove it's his writing. That's the best. And they may start with that. As a fallback, you don't even need to put him on the stand. You can say, what the hell does it mean? Marcia says that Bob's defense team would have plenty to work with to attack the note and the misspelling. Handwriting analysis is challenging evidence because it can be open to interpretation. But she says that as filmmakers, we're in a unique position to get more from Bob. You know, what he says to each of you, it's more compelling coming from you guys with him than it will ever be with a police officer, ever. The police officer are taking a statement, you run the risk of Miranda violations and a coercion and all the lawyers will throw everything and the kitchen sink at those statements. You're not a police officer, you're not sitting in an interrogation room, he's not in handcuffs. The more he talks to you, the better. So 
we needed more material from him and we wanted him to react to some things, particularly some material that we had discovered along the way. Here's Andrew talking about the necessity of a second interview with Bob in a never-before-heard behind-the-scenes HBO interview. And so I called him and I said, we want to do a follow-up interview, as we discussed. Hey, it's Jarecki. Hey, Andrew, it's Bob. Hi. So I am on my way to Madrid on Friday, and I'll be back in a week. All right. I don't think we're talking about something very extensive. We're here and come over anytime. Yeah, I'd rather go to Madrid and come back. Sounds good. Have a good time in Madrid. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bob does things when he wants to and only when he wants to. He also lies his ass off. We all know this, but I still have to remind Andrew and Mark from time to time. We know where he is in Spain. Yeah, he's in Madrid. Well, we don't know that he's in Madrid. I mean, we, I, I find him to be genuine. Yeah, he's lying about that. Truthful. Are you guys fucking kidding me? Over the next several months, Bob and Andrew play an epic game of phone tag. Hey, it's Jarecki. I was wondering if maybe that was Jarecki. Hi, this is Bob. He's not available. Hey, Bob, it's Andrew Jarecki. Um, so I got your message. I mean, of course I'm free on November 3rd and November 4th, um, but that's forever from now. I thought you were coming back on the 22nd. Um, at some point, I might have to start making another movie. Bob? Yes? I'm seeing you on Tuesday morning, yes? No. There was a lot of discussion about whether Bob was going to do the second interview with Andrew. Mark didn't think so. I feel like we're just... I, 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 I hate to say it, I want to be the nice air, but it just doesn't sound like he's going to do it. It sounds like he's just going to keep putting it off and keep seesawing and torturing us. But Andrew thought that if he stayed close to Bob, he would eventually be able to convince him. Hello? Cherecki. Hey, Andrew, how are you? Um, I am ready to be filmed if you're still interested in doing that. I am, of course. Operation Interview was a go. We got to work scouting locations in New York City to shoot, and eventually landed on a conference room in the Regency Hotel. Andrew talked about preparing for the final sit-down with Bob in that unreleased HBO behind-the-scenes interview. The whole process of interviewing somebody is a dance. And like in any dance, there's sort of that question of who's leading. Sometimes you lead for a little while, and then sometimes your partner leads for a little while. And that's what's so interesting about the dance of doing this interview, is that I know things, he doesn't know what I know, he knows things, I don't know what he knows. So he's got to always be playing a game about how much information to reveal. The crew met the day before the big interview for a dress rehearsal. We set up all the cameras and lights, and we actually filmed it as if it was the real thing. Here we are going through some of the materials that Andrew was going to show Bob. I like that one. Especially if it's not from him, and it'll grab his interest. He'll yeah. be like, oh, wow, I mean, he's remembering. Yeah. That girl, you know? We've been discussing for weeks at this point how to confront Bob with our evidence. And in debate prep fashion, I play Bob in the dress rehearsal. So you're going to be passing them to him? Is he, he gonna, he's going to be more like this, probably. I guess I don't know how he's going to be. We've got a chance to get Bob to weigh in on a couple other pieces of evidence not covered in Andrew's first interview with him. Like something Bob wrote around the time his wife Kathy disappeared, commonly referred to as the dig note. Here I am again, doing my best Bob Durst impression. All right, can you read it to me? Allen dump, bridge, dig, boat, other, shovel, something. Or? Or, car, truck, rest. Right. Town dump, bridge, dig, boat. Sure seems like a list of ways to dispose of a body. One of Kathy's friends found it in the trash can at Bob and Kathy's lake house. Gilberta found it and gave it to the police. She was digging through your trash, and she found this. So tell, this, me, tell me about this. This looks like a note I would have written, but I don't remember writing this note specifically. I sound just like him, right? I was very much tapped in. That's method acting. Yeah, I don't know. It's going to be a gar gardening list. Sometimes I did gardening, and I don't know what it is. So right, I'm not going to press him too hard on this. I'm not going to say, so you would garden on a bridge? 
Something else we wanted to ask Bob about are the phone calls he made from prison, threatening to kill his brother. Andrew shows me, as Bob, a New York Post article that says, the Durst tapes, bitter Robert planned to knock off his brother. All right, so now I, I want to show you this. Tell me about this, the, the stuff about the Durst tapes. Uh, yeah, they, uh, when you're in jail, they record all your conversations. Somebody at the jail had released my conversations to the press. So, they, so what did they do? You uh, Tell me about that. You made a phone call. Yeah, well, it says on the, when you make a phone call, it says that you're So I was new. I never thought it would end up on the front page of the post. Next, the newest and perhaps most damning piece of evidence we have, the envelope that matches the cadaver note. And we have a plan. First, Andrew will take out the letter and ask Bob to read it. And read me the note. Susie, now and again, I think about old times. Good luck, Bobby. Then he will reveal the envelope that the letter came in. So I want to show you the, the uh, envelope that that came in. Can you read me the um, read me the address on this? Yes. Okay. It's hard to come back from that. Well, yeah, I don't and, I, I, and, I, and, and if you look at it like this. Yeah, exactly. Now, now you you're know. getting a little more aggressive. And finally, Andrew will confront Bob with both misspellings. What can you tell me about the word Beverly on both of these documents? It's uh, spelled the same way. And why do you, why is that? No idea. I've always spelled it wrong. We test various Bob reactions, playing it out in all the different ways we can think of. To me, it seems like you wrote the good acronym. That's very disappointing to hear. It's a very strange coincidence, but I did not write the cadaver. So you say that- I don't think I'm the only person that misspells Beverly I in that knew, way. I always knew that Zach was the guy. <laughs> God, what is he gonna do? The main discussion between Mark and Andrew was how far to push Bob during the interview. I mean, how much harder do I want to go than I'm going I right now? I can say, in your interview with me, you told me that the person who was wrote the cadaver note was murdered. That's what I don't want to say, because I guess I'm trying to keep the relationship going. Andrew was trying to thread the needle of confronting Bob, but maintaining their relationship. The morning of the interview, we all get to the Regency early. Bob's not due for another hour, and Andrew stands by the window to reflect with Mark. I mean, I'm very, I'm very nervous about it. I woke up early this morning. You know, I've spent a lot of time on the phone with him, a lot of time talking to him. I think that Bob is a lot more volatile than I've ever thought before. And maybe that's what I had to think in order to do everything we've done, in order to be as close to him as I've become. Maybe I had to imagine that he was more rational. For years, I've been saying to people, I'm not afraid of him. I don't feel fear. But at the same time, you know, you can't help but consider that if you're about to let him know that, you know, you're potentially becoming the enemy. And then Bob saunters into the lobby. Hey, Bob. What? How are you doing? Nice to see you again. Let's go upstairs. Our set in the conference room is buzzing. Andrew and Bob are wired up with microphones, and they take their places sitting next to each other at the table. I'm sitting cross-legged on the floor. I can't see them very well as the interview begins. Marco, you ready? Yes. All right, so we're gonna go through a bunch of stuff. As planned, Andrew begins the interview with a few softball questions. That's me and my yellow horse. I love my yellow horse. My mother told me it used to get covered with wee-wee and they would hose it off. And then Andrew shows Bob the dig note, that suspicious list that Kathy's friend found in the trash. All right, this is this thing that I got from Gilberta, which I thought you might want to respond to. She made a big deal out of it. I don't think she ever got any traction. Wait, 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 wait. Owl dump, bridge, dig, boat of the... Shovel or question mark 
Quest check, cars, truck, rent? R maybe rent, rent a truck or rent a... This, I think, says town dump. I think Gilberta found this in the trash. Dump, bridge, dig, boat, other, shovel or check, car, chuck, rental. So this is my handwriting. But I have no idea what that means, what I was writing. And she found this in the trash around the time when Kathy disappeared. Yeah. So I think and she did was... she figure it all out? Evidently, evidently town not. dump bridge. I don't even know where the town dump is up there. They they collected garbage. Yeah, I mean I think her what she said to the police was, well, this was the list that Bob made after Kathy was dead. These were his options of what to do with the body. Well, if Coberta can figure it out, God bless, because I don't know. It's time for the big showdown. I distinctly remember this moment of Andrew taking out the letter and showing it to Bob. All right, I want to ask you about this address. Susie, now and again, I think about old times. GD, good luck, Bobby. Do you remember writing this to Susan? No, not at all. My theory is that this probably was you sending her some oh, support. Oh, that's possible. That certainly is possible. I can easily see writing that letter and putting a check in there. And then Andrew reveals the envelope. His hands are shaking. I don't blame him. I remember I was holding my breath. I want to show you the envelope that that letter came in. Would you read me the address on this envelope? Robert Durst, floor 24, 67 Wall Street, New York, New York, 10005. And who you sent it to? Susan Berman, 1527 Benedict Canyon, Beverly Hills, California. Beverly spelled wrong, California, 90210. So obviously I want to ask you about the cadaver note, the famous cadaver note. Can you read me the spelling of Beverly, Beverly Hills, Hills? Police, 1527 Benedict Canyon, cadaver. The same misspelling. So Beverly is spelled the same way on this and the same way on this. Same misspelling. What does that say to you? Well, I mean, the writing looks similar and the spelling is, is the same, so I can see the conclusion the cops would draw or the <laughs> writing exemplar person would conclude they were both written by the same person. As Andrew shows Bob the evidence, he starts rubbing his face and burping. He's visibly rattled. I gotta say, I nailed his response. Listen to me from the day before. They look very similar, but they're block letters. I mean, block letters look similar. That's, they're block letters. Block letters? Our block letters. I mean, it's almost. I really was tapped in. So, I guess the question is, did you write the cadaver note? No, I didn't write the cadaver note. So you wrote this, but you didn't write this. Definitely wrote this, but I definitely did not write that. So you wrote one of these, but you didn't write the other one. I wrote this one, but I did not write the cadaver one. Andrew then shows Bob a comparison with the two Beverly's side by side but he doesn't tell Bob which one's from which note. And can you tell me which one you didn't write? No. In the TV show, that's where the interview ends. But in reality, Andrew and Bob have another interesting exchange about Susan Berman. I want to show you a photograph. Now this may have been, is this the, is this the book party? That's the book party. Does it give you any feeling? Does it have any resonance for you? The picture has been around forever. I remember us hugging in, in, at the book party. I don't like the way Susan looks there. Yeah, she looks She's got a much bigger mouth than I remember. She looks a little goofy. It's kind of amazing that Bob's comment on this photo is that Susan's got a much bigger mouth than he remembered. As a lot of people say, it was her threatening to talk to the police that got her killed. 
And, and I'm guessing that since Kathy's got her coat on, that we were just getting ready to leave. And then the interview is over. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, the player. And it's five after four. Perfect ah. timing. Bob stands up, and it feels like the air is back in the room. The crew takes down the lights, and I offer Bob a sandwich. You want to take one of these sandwiches, Bob? Yeah, but we can wrap one up in an That's axle, so man. Sandwich. <laughs> what are we going to do with them? I got some plastic. So, so, so what do we got? We got roast beef. Yeah, roast beef, and I think this is turkey and bacon, and this looks like tuna. Is there something I could take? A, 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 yeah. a, a turkey and a roast beef in? Absolutely. Bob did take a sandwich. I wrap it up for him. While I'm wrapping up the sandwich, Bob is looking for the bathroom. I am going to go use the restroom, which is right here. Okay. When Bob comes out of the bathroom, I take off his microphone. Oh, yeah, I forgot. It's probably down. Here. It would be around a year before we would learn the relevance of Bob having gone into the bathroom still wearing a mic. But that day, I asked him for a picture. Can you take a pic? Can we take a picture together? Do you mind? You and me? Is that okay? I'll take it. In the photo, you got to see it. We'll post it somewhere. I have the biggest grin on my face. And Bob, he's completely stone faced. But when he put his arm around me, I remember he grabbed me really tight around the waist. Back and give it on. All right. One, two. Bob shakes everyone's hands, and he and Andrew walk towards the elevator. All right, I think Mark is down. Is Mark downstairs? So we're gonna see him on our way out. Bye. Mark's ahead of them with his camera to get a shot of Bob leaving the building, and in the video, Bob and Andrew walk out onto the street. Bob shakes Andrew's hand, and then. Bob raises his hands, like in the don't shoot position, almost like he thinks the police are there to arrest him. But the police aren't there. He puts his hands down, then he walks away. Upstairs, Andrew regroups with the crew. Very well done. Guys, I, I want to thank everybody. That was a fucking group effort. Really well, well done. Amazing, amazing. You should feel really good about that. We had a big day today. Andrew's strategy of threading the needle and keeping his relationship with Bob alive, it worked. Because the day after the interview, Bob reached out. Hello. Hey, it's Andrew. Oh, hi. Good. I'm just looking up at my wall now. Bob says he has a list of a couple things to talk about. I almost forgot that that photograph you gave me of Susan Berman and I with the greenery behind us. I know where that was. That was in West. That was in Key West. Key West. Right. But then he gets to the heart of why he's calling. In terms of the writing, what you were saying that my writing was, was similar to theirs, a writing exemplar, I met with the DA's writing exemplar, I met with our writing exemplar, and they make you do block letters in 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 little squares, like they used to make us do on our high school tests and something like that. And then the the, the uh, writing exemplar for my team would be explaining that there's just not that many many ways to make capital block letters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they. Many, many, many of them look pretty much the same. Um, all right, that's what I wanted to tell you. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks very much. I'll talk to you soon. Bye, bye. Bob goes back to his life. The next step for the filmmakers is turning over the evidence to law enforcement. You know, you can tell he's getting kind of emotional and he just goes, no, no or did, that was during the actual letter. Oh, uh, really? He yeah. did kind of he have got, a moment. He got, then he was burping. He was uncomfortable. It's amazing. I can't wait to see the stuff. Let's get it in the computer immediately on hard drives in several different locations. Well, 
Yeah. They might arrest him, and we might be able to shoot Andrew at us watching television. And they're like, a warrant has been issued for the arrest of Bob Durst, who now is in Cuba, or something like that. I don't think he's going to arrest him. I mean, I just feel like, I feel like we can make our movie now. Next time on the official Jinx podcast, the filmmakers turn over the evidence and discover what Bob was really saying in the bathroom. The official Jinx podcast is hosted by me, Zach Stewart-Pontier. It's produced by ZSP Media and Hit the Ground Running Films with HBO. Watch episodes of The Jinx and stream The Jinx Part 2 starting April 21st on Max. This episode was produced by Naomi Bronner and Ramoy Phillip. The rest of our team is Ethan Oberman and Laura Newcomb. The supervising producer is Liz Stiles. This episode was edited by Simone Polanin. Mixing and engineering by Sam Baer. It was recorded by Brett Tubin at Relic Room in New York City. Music by Wes Dylan Thordson. Additional music courtesy of HBO. The executive producers are Andrew Jarecki and me, Zach Stewart-Pontier. Special thanks to Michael Gluckstadt, Ali Cohen, Aaron Kelly, and Savon Slater at HBO Podcasts. And the fabulous Jinx team, Sam Neve, Kyle Martin, Charlotte Kaufman, Richard Hankin, Susan Lazarus, Annabelle White, Pedro Vital, Jesse Herman, Akeli Zabarfian, and Nako Narder. And thanks to Roe Dillon, George Vogel, Charlie Wessler, Nancy Jarecki, and Emily Wiedemann. Thank you for listening and making it all the way through the credits. Here's me in an outtake playing Robert Durst in our dress rehearsal. Okay, so I left uh, the Durst organization in the early 90s, but I was spending most of my time in Eureka, Northern California. And read me the note. Susie, now and again I think about old times. Good luck, Bobby. I mean, is it, why is the note so short? Uh, probably, I was probably sending her a check. I sent her checks. But, Media likes to say that I only sent her money after the case was reopened, but that's not true.